What's going on guys, away from Revolution and the Rake here, here with a guy I admire so much, um, a dear friend, the one and only Mark Cho. Mark, how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you for having me. Certainly you are another man I admire, and plus, I actually just came here to have a smoke. <laughs> I, I was dying for someone to smoke in Singapore, and here we are. So Mark has been going through the ordeal of trying to find an indoor uh, smoking location in Singapore. Of course, there are a couple of them, we know what they are, you know, some of those, but they're also extremely expensive. So he just wanted to have a, you know, cigar. I think you actually tried to create your own like like makeshift cigar smoking area. Yeah, I did. Correct? I sat near a trash can and near a bunch of cardboard boxes. It was sad, but you know, I got my drugs in. Thank you, fantastic. Mm, yeah. Sounds very rustic. It does sound very rustic, that's right. <laughs> so also, um, we're gonna open beers as well because um, Mark has just gone through a little bit of an ordeal. He had left um, what I can only say ah. is a staggering collection <laughs> of hor horological finery uh, on his hotel room desk. Uh, showed up here and he was like, shit, I forgot the watches, and then has had to endure Singapore traffic there back and then back again, so I think we deserve a beer. Yeah, that was a, that was a low point, to show up at an interview about watches without the actual watches. It's, uh, <laughs> smarter things have been done. Not, not at all, Mark. No. No. And, and um, it's five o'clock on a Friday afternoon, so what a better time to, to have a beer than now. So, shall we crack this open? Is it weird open? to have a beer with a cigar, actually? Would you like something else? Would you like a Negroni? No, no, I'm, I'm good. Let's, let's test it out. Okay, let's find out, let's find out the hard way. This is, this is wonderful, by the way. Yeah? This is incredible. Cool. Yeah. Man, thank you very much. My absolute pleasure. Okay, so Mark, we have the pleasure of, of viewing your, some of your horological masterpieces, and the first watch I want to talk about is your Jorn, of course. Sure. And the reason why I want to talk about your Jorn is actually, I think there's a wonderful story that goes with this in terms of like how the good guys end up winning, right? Yeah. Because this relates not to this watch, which but this watch came about because of another watch, which you later discovered was stolen, which set into motion a whole kind of ordeal for you. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Um, some people might have heard this story before, but. Bear with me. So uh, I have been collecting joins for quite a while. I was collecting them when they weren't such a hot thing. And uh, I always liked smaller watches. So one of the pieces that I collected was an Okta Divine 36 millimeters, which actually technically was a ladies watch in their catalog, but I liked it and I managed to find one in the US and I bought it and it was great. And then one day the date window stopped advancing and I was like, ah, oh, nuts, okay. So I sent it in to Jorn for repairs and I get this letter back from Jorn and they're like, oh, we're very sorry, but we have to confiscate your watch. I was like, oh. And they're like, yeah, your watch is a um, stolen good. That's incredible. And, I was, and please produce all the paperwork and uh, all the evidence that you bought this in good faith. So I was like, of course. And so uh, luckily I had like all the various kind of email, uh, email threads and the payment records uh, to this dealer that I bought it from. And they're like, okay, thank you. Uh, obviously you've proven that you didn't you know, buy a stolen good uh, per uh, on purpose. And, um, I was like, how did you know this was stolen? And they were like, oh, well, we have the insurance records. This watch was actually stolen from our boutique uh, 10 years ago. I was like, 10 wow. years ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So well, probably. actually now, today, probably like 14 years ago. But at the time, it was 10 years ago. Yeah. And were you corresponding with Pierre Halimi at the time? I was, I was dealing with Pierre Halimi, who is one of my favorite people. Um, Pierre's awesome, and he, you know, he was very nice about the whole thing. I right. mean, it was super awkward, right? <laughs> like, but he was super nice about the whole thing. Right. And um, so Pierre and I kind of developed a rapport and he was like, you know, next time you're in New York, come by and, and visit us at the boutique. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, of course. So I went by and I went to see him at the boutique, which was cool. And um, as we were having a chat, uh, two of my really good customers in New York walked into the boutique. Right. And I was like, oh, hey, John, hey. And um, JS, Pierre, right. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, Pierre was like, oh, you know these guys? I was like, yeah, 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 you know, it's, they, they shop with me. And, and so Pierre was like, oh, that's interesting. And so he started to realize like the Armory and Jorn probably could do some interesting stuff together. So next thing you know, we were like doing some joint events together and Pierre being a very generous person uh, asked if I wanted to borrow one of his watches. I'm, I don't know if this was him like seeding something in the future, <laughs> but um, you know, he knew I was a Sears collector and, and so I, I was like, yeah, sure, I'd love to borrow something out of your collection. So Pierre actually owns like the hundredth Jorn made of every single model. Wow. Right? Yeah. Well it's, done, Pierre. Yeah, well done, Pierre, indeed. <laughs> and so I borrowed his Resonance, right. which was a super beautiful Resonance, actually, because it, it was the first series you right. know, with the two symmetrical dials, um, but it had actually started to patina. Yes. So that like champagne gold color was starting to look more kind of bronzish. It was really beautiful. I bought that for a while, and then later on, Pierre was like, you know, I know you always prefer 38 millimeter watches. Would you ever be interested in having one made? Mm -hmm. And I, I had never 
I had the opportunity to do something like that. So I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Okay, sure. Um, so I sat down and I thought about it and I was like, okay, I want to make a, uh, I would love to make a resonance. You've lent me this resonance for so long. I really love it. I would love to make a resonance. Right. Um, and he said, okay, well, just like submit a design, blah, blah, blah. And so um, I spent a while, I spent a couple months actually, just like Photoshopping different color options together. Um, and in fact, I, what I originally wanted was a white dial. And that was based on the, the repeater, is that right? Uh, even before that, actually, right. it was actually based on um, the long, the Longa Boutique Edition Chrono. You know, because right. that one's like white silver on the dial yes. and then like blue mark. It's really beautiful, right? Yes. Um, so that was like one in, one point of inspiration. And then um, there was an art exhibition as well. That there was. So that came a little later. So what happened was like I was talking to my colleagues at work, and they were like, "Oh, you know, maybe some people at the store would be interested in this." And I was like, "Oh, that's true." Like, so I went. I, I was thinking, well, if it's for other people, they probably would prefer a blue dial over a white dial. Because a white dial is like cool, but it's really cool for me. Like, whereas I think a blue dial has a bit of a broader appeal. Um, and I agree. so, yeah, there you go, right? The point, <laughs> the point proven. Um, and so I happened to be in London and I was at, at this exhibition for Andreas Gursky, who's a great photographer. And there was this beautiful image that had just like all the right shades in it. And so I took a photograph, a photograph of that, and I just started sampling colors out of that and putting them into the Photoshop um, that I had of the resonance. So it was like an ocean blue um, for the dial. Um, something that uh, I've that I wouldn't say like bothers me about Jorn, but something I've always wanted to change about Jorn's is like I just find the lettering really stark. Right. And so I really wanted to use like a warm right. gray for the lettering. That was really important to me. So I, I changed all the lettering on the main dial to warm gray. Um, on the sub dial, I used uh, navy lettering because um, my customer, JS, actually lent me, um, again, I don't know why, I guess he just knew I would like it and he was right. He lent me his repeater. And the repeater, you remember the old classic repeater was like silver with uh, navy markings, it was right. awesome. And so I really wanted to have all the sub dials with white and navy markings. Right. And um, uh, it's chronometric à resonance, right? So I put like a gold A at For the, the armory. Yeah, just right. a nice nod to the armory, right? right. And I submitted to Pierre and Pierre submitted to, to um, FP. And you know, I didn't really know what would happen. I didn't really know if like this thing would ever get approved or anything like that. Um, but it did. In fact, FP only made one change. Uh, so for the subdials, he wanted only the right hand subdial to be white and navy. And then he wanted the other subdial to be in the standard like white, black, and red markings. Okay. And his logic was, well, you know, they're two different times, so they shouldn't share the same color. So I was like, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, and that was kind of it. Like, I think, what was it? Maybe like about a year later, right. um, I took delivery of uh, this blue dial resonance and uh, we actually used up the last five 30 millimeter platinum resonance cases at the manufacturer. And those went to like, just like really good kind of friends slash clients of mine at the armory, oh, JS sure. being one of them. In fact, actually, because um, JS, uh, my customer was is such a good client of Jorn, I think honestly that's really what helped push it past the line, right? Because I was just like a Yahoo who had <laughs> Mark, come on, no, so you're, you're hardly a Yahoo. No, no, but, no. But yeah, like, so, yeah. so that, that was cool. And then- And those um, watches are, are freaking unicorns, right? Because they're, they they're 38 yeah. mm platinum resonances yeah. in the configurations of the last series of resonances, yeah. but in a completely different size. Yeah. The last ones were 40. Yeah. So, And dude. what's interesting is that you know, because I forgot this too, like the resonance case is different from all the other cases because mm -hmm. you got to open for the crown at different points, right? Yes. You got one at 12 o'clock and you went at five o'clock. Right. Um, so, you know, they might have other 30 millimeter cases for the other models, but definitely not for the resonance anymore. Yeah, well, I was, yeah. when I was um, reading about the watch, I was thinking the same thing because it's like the last 38 mm platinum cases, but they had to be resonance cases as well, right? Not just random 38 exactly. mm platinum cases. In fact, I figured that out because I was thinking, oh man, it'd be so cool to have like the matching platinum bracelet for this, right? But it was too much money to buy a new bracelet. So I was thinking, oh, maybe, and this was when you could still get joins relatively cheap. Maybe I could buy one of the other models with and the, put bracelet the bracelet and on and there. switch it over. Right. And I asked Pierre, hey, would that work? And he's like, no, because the crown's in the way. And I was like, oh, nuts. Actually, right. it is. Yes, Yeah, exactly, right? right? Like the crown's going to get in the way at 12 o'clock. Yeah, yeah. That's a, that's a smart idea though, because like um, uh, that's you know, like I love Langas on Wellendorf's, mm. you know, and a lot of people I know go and buy the, the Wellendorf bracelets off of the a Langa one, for example, yeah. and then put it on a datagraph, you know. So like, um, yeah, those bracelets are beautiful. They're incredible. But you know what? I got I got to say this publicly. They're too long. They're really long, man. Yes. 
I, I, so I've seen one and I put it on and I was like, there's no way this could fit me. Even yes. if you adjusted out all the links, no way you could fit me. And also they're really, really expensive. How much are they? I have no idea. <laughs> there's a, a watch brand that um, I love, which is based in Geneva, and we're going to see two of their watches later. And I remember I was very happy to be, re you know, receive an Andrew series um, perpetual calendar chronograph from them. And I was like, dude, I love this watch, but mm -hmm. how, how much doper would it be to have this watch? on a bracelet, right? You know, mm -hmm. which is very rarely given to, to people, um, that opportunity to have it on a bracelet. So I, I asked people from the brand, they said, well, you know, why don't you ask when the correct person to speak to is in the right mood? Mm. And I said, oh, okay. And mm -hmm. then I was like, I should just ask, how mm. much will this be? And they're like, it's probably gonna be about 70 or 80,000 Swiss francs. Jesus. And I'm like, so, that's a little bit out of my price range, you know? Yeah. Okay, so let's go back to the Jorn. So you created this extraordinary watch, which probably now is worth an absolute fortune. Most Jorns are worth quite a lot of money, but this is incredibly rare, and also to me, uh, from a proportion perspective, spectacular. Thanks, man. But let's go back to the Octo Divine, right? So, ah, yeah. So, so I would imagine, like having realized that this watch was stolen, you would go back to the person that you bought it from and be like, "Hey, dude." Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you gotta take it back, right? Or pay me back, right? Yeah. yeah. You're absolutely right. So I went back to the dealer and I was like, you sold me a stolen watch. Right. Um, and I'd like to get my money back. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, obviously it's your responsibility to go and get your money back from the guy who sold it to you. Right. And they're like, no, we're gonna tell you who sold it to us and you can go and chase them. You're kidding me. No. And so I was like, ooh, no, well, I, like that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, of course. I pushed a little bit longer, but they were not cooperative. So then unfortunately I had to take it to a lawyer. So I got a lawyer, you know, put out a letter, blah, 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 and then um, eventually they settled, actually, thankfully. So I spent Good. a bit on legal fees, but they settled and they covered part of my legal fees. I was a little bit out of pocket on the whole thing, but it was fine. Right. And then actually I was talking to Pierre, and Pierre's like, you know, if you want that watch back, I can see if I can get the watch back. Because the insurer probably had it by this point. Exactly. The insurer right. has it, right? Because right. technically it's the insurer's watch at this point. Because they've already paid out that insurance. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And then the insurer doesn't um, account for recovery. Like, they don't really factor in what happens if the watch ever comes back. So they're happy to just, like, be able to cash out on the watch anyways. Right. So I got the watch back for a good price, and then Pierre helped me service it. And there you go, it's back in my collection So you have too. that one too? Yeah. And that's the, the, the yeah. watch that started this yeah. whole relationship with uh, Pierre yeah. and with uh, Jordan. Yeah, that's my set, right? Dude, I that's got this fantastic. Also Divine 36 and I got this 30 millimeter resonance. Nice one. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it, I like it also because it's like a story where the good guy wins, which incidentally just, um, you know, I know a lot of people are buying stuff on the, the pre-owned market, um, but just, just do some research on, on who you buy from, right? Because that's just not cool what that guy did. Okay, let's go from there to a watch made in Japan. Okay. Naoya Hide. And he's a very interesting character to me mm. as well because he was around the watch industry for quite some time. I think he, he was, got his start yeah. in Desco. Yeah. He was um, working with Jorn as well yeah. at one point. Yeah. Uh, I think most recently before he started his own brand, he was working with Ralph Lauren that's right. as well. And I think Ralph Lauren's like the, Japan's like the number one market for Ralph Lauren watches. Yeah. That's right. He came in with his own brand, and I, you were telling me the Type 1A was the prototype, the Type yeah. 1B, which is what you have here, mm -hmm. uh, is the first production watch as well. Yeah. And when I look at this, it's interesting because, I, first of all, I think it's exquisite in terms of a finishing perspective from the front of the watch, but it also reminds me of um, a paddock, you know? Uh, a a reference right. 96, which I know you have one of those as yes, well, also with Brigade Numerals as well. Yes, I do. So why did you want to buy that? Um, it was just one of those love at first sight things, to be honest. Uh, I saw it and I thought, wow, the proportion's really beautiful and um, the hands are really unusual. Like, I think it's a really good fusion of um, kind of like a lot of vintage ideas in design merged with a lot of modern production techniques, you know? Like, people have been using the term neo-vintage to refer to watches um, that are, you know, for sale that, uh, from the 90s and afterwards, right? But actually, I, I was using the word neo-vintage for something like this. Right. Neo-vintage as in like it has that vintage look to it, but it's trying to leverage modern techniques, right? Correct. So like rather than use traditional case maker and traditional parts makers, um, they use this Japanese company that specializes in like precision engineered parts. Oh, that's cool. Um, for the aeronautics industry and for the automotive industry. And they're also using 904 steel, right? As yes. As opposed to 316. Exactly. Yeah. That was, because Hida, when he was, um, when he was working for like one of his one of the Japanese distributors when he was younger earlier in his career, noticed that a lot of the watches that were coming back that were pitted right. um, tended to be watches that went three one six, and so he was like, and then I noticed like when Rolex switched over the steel, that basically never happened anymore. Wow. And so I was I really wanted to use nine oh four for like my watches as well, which I thought was cool. He says it's a little bit more difficult to work with, um, but you know it's a little bit more robust as well. 
Amazing. Beautiful watch, a German silver dial. Yes. Uh, hand engraved indexes, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Which then correct. have a, I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, it's a cashew urushi. That, yes. Well, yes. What is a cashew urushi? Oh. It's just the name of the paint. Okay. It's just a type of urushi paint. Right. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting about the dial is that the dial plate itself is much thicker than a normal dial. And that's what allows you to hand engrave it. Because traditional watch dials, normal watch dials, are too thin to actually withstand the engraving process. And you know this, this is really more of like a pocket watch making technique, right? Like in a pocket watch, given the size of it, you can have thicker dial plates, you can start having chapter rings that could be placed in, and you can actually like engrave into the dial without breaking it. Amazing. Yeah. I have to say I, I really also applaud him in terms of the proportions of the watch because yeah. It actually, when I first read the, uh, the height, it's like 9.8 mm, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's like fairly thick, and I guess that's also part of it, because uh, he's using a 7.750 as his base, which that's he right. then you know, changes quite significantly. It takes that's all right. the automatic stuff off. Yeah. He changes also the barrel, the click, a bunch of different, because I think he wanted like the, the, the- The click is very significant, yes. <laughs> he wanted the, the click to have a very specific sun and a specific yeah. tactile feel, yeah. which I like that, you know? Yeah. Um, but it looks remarkably proportional. Great watch. Yeah. I you know, it's uh, it's both like not a watch that could have been born of that era, right. but it like evokes that era in for me like really the right way. Yes, and the hands I think are also super interesting because he um, the hands are milled; they're not stamped. Oh wow! Okay. And so that's what gives it that like really bulbous shape with that very fine tapering point. Oh yeah! And then they also hand like they bend the hand downwards slightly at the tip. Amazing. Yeah. So we're gonna go from this to uh, what? the guys at Swiss Watch Gang called a unicorn. Um, <laughs> and he, they are correct, incidentally. Um, and to, to Christian Kling's watch. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Christian Kling's is now retired, correct? He's officially retired. Oh, I see. So he's, he's officially, officially retired. retired. Yes. And I, I remember at the time when you wrote your uh, Rob Report article, he made 33 watches. 30, actually. He's this working watch on the 30. 30. First, right now. Okay. Number thirty. Because so he's got like a little bit of an order, a couple of orders left. That he's got to finish up. Okay. So yeah. he's got. Uh, he's got a couple of watches left. Uh, well, I mean, because he's got like he's got an order book, right? But he's not taking any new orders, is he? No. Okay. He he really wants to retire and work on his church work. Seventh like he does social work. Right? Exactly. Seventh yes. day Adventist. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So uh, tell us a little about this watch. First of all, guys, it's a PS Unique, and second of all, um, it is a watch that basically mark up the design with Christian Kling's uh, the movement from from a white piece of paper, I would imagine. Right? Yeah, it was basically a napkin. That's <laughs> it was, it was <laughs> and, and the movement on this, you know, honestly, when I turn it over, um, and you'll see it in a bit, it's, it's open work, full bridge, uh, with these finger bridges for pretty much the entire gear train and the balance wheel um, in steel, beautifully designed bridges. Every one of these bridges looks like it, it's been treated in a way like the, you know, bridge on a balance, uh, no, a bridge on a tourbillon will be treated. You know? Yeah, I mean, because he traditionally makes tourbillons. He doesn't make very many um, non-tourbillon watches, right. but um, he's done one open work movement before. I saw a guy write an article about it on, I think, watches by SJX, right. and I just thought it was beautiful. So right. I asked if he could make me one, but in a much smaller size. Because the other one he did was like 38 millimeters, something like that. And this is 36.5. Yes, this is his physical limit. So he can't make any smaller than this, because he just can't, he doesn't have the physical control anymore to okay. like make it any smaller than this. Uh, so uh, brass movement that has been plated in gold, but then the bridges and barrel cover are in steel, correct? Yes. And in fact, he actually mixes two types of gold. So he has yellow gold and red gold, depending on if it's a wheel or a plate. Ah, fantastic. Yeah, which I thought was really cool. But tell me about the iconography of this movement. For, for example, the bridges, which I love the design of. Was mm -hmm. that something you guys discussed, you know? Um, I said, please make it open work. And then he came back with one set of drawings. And I said, is there something more we can do to just like carve away a little bit more from wow. this? And he's like, yeah, I think so. And so he, you know, he kind of revised it on paper with me and they started to make it. That's extraordinary. Yeah. It is one of the most breathtaking movements I've ever seen. Thanks, and let's man. not forget about the dial as well, which is uh, yeah. stunning. So tell us a little bit about that. You know, like I, I love like George Daniel's work. I love Roger Smith's work, of yeah. course. And also old pocket watches as well. We always come back to this, right? Yes. Like the way those chapter rings interact is always super interesting. You know, like um, are they slightly offset? Mm -hmm. Does one interla interlock into the other? Um, and so I was kind of trying to play with that a little bit and I wanted uh, the subseconds chapter ring to sink down a little bit. Right. And I wanted the subseconds to really be oversized. Right. Like that's something actually, for instance, I really love on longas. Like yeah. old longas especially have really beautiful big subseconds, which I just, I just think is a cool look. Conversely, like when I see like 
especially like newer paddocks with those really small little sub. <laughs> I find that like slightly upsetting. To be <laughs> Everyone has things to upset them. Right? Yeah, I, 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 I get what you're saying. Yeah. I get what you're saying. Uh, no, it's absolutely stunning. Uh, Gearsham and Dial uh, in German silver, um, two different types of. So you get barley corn in the center. You've got this amazing sort of like radiating um, a gear shape from the center of the sub second style as well. Mm -hmm. And then tell us a little bit about the conversation you had with him related to the color of the indexes. Because I love that. He, like, he felt like black would be too stark. Was that something? Yeah, like? yeah. I, um, I mean, I always Photoshop these things before we make anything because it's, it's a nice way to, to visualize it, right? Right. And um, I had Photoshopped it. Like, at one point, it got, yeah. at one point, we got to a stage where we were thinking, oh, is it possible to actually make a two tone? Because originally it was just meant to be German silver dial, everything's right. in silver, blue hands, blue markings, right. right? And then I was like, oh, it might be nice to do something a little different. So then I started playing with like salmon dials, and with the salmon, like the black on the salmon looks really good. Nice. And so I originally suggested the black, and then um, Christian was like, oh, maybe we, we dial it back a little bit and we make it a dark gray, like an anthracite. So it's he he paints the hands. Yeah. So oh, they're wow. not toasted. They're they're painted. Oh wow. Yeah. And he doesn't. He does, he does He's really the one. Like, he does everything. Right. Like the only thing he doesn't do is the crystal. Um, that's it, basically. <laughs> I mean, it, like stuff like the rubies, right? So he's making the cases as well. Yeah. So he gets a blank stamped. Wow. Um, but then he does everything else. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. I get you. Like, in fact, I was really interested by. Like, I was really fascinated by the case because when I first saw a sample of this watch, mm -hmm. I saw it at um, the Independence Exhibition. Uh, that Philips organized. You remember that when they were doing the do. auction tour and they also had a bunch yeah. of images following around? So they had one of these on display, like a more basic version. And I was like, oh man, that's really beautiful. And for some reason, they just seemed to like fly under the radar of everybody. Like no one was that interested. But when I saw it, I was like, oh man, this is amazing. I mean, the irony is like, if you look at that now, unfortunately, now that the man is retired, I'm sure everyone's just gonna be like, dude, that's extraordinary, right? But I think for the right guy, yeah. For the right guy who likes like something very subtle and very small, like, I think it's awesome. Yes, absolutely. Um, but you know, the minute I picked it up, right, it has this kind of like pebble-like soft shape to yes. it. And the only other time I've felt like a shape like that was J.P. Hagman's cases. Nice. Right? So like I was handling um, a 3974 at one of the auction previews. Nice. I was like, oh wow, this feels so good, right? So I was talking to Christian about like, why is it that these handmade cases like give you that sort of feeling? And he was like, oh, well, you know, like when you start to shape these things by hand and you're doing the filing and the polishing by hand, like you can, you can constantly adjust the radius that you're working with. Like, wow. So as you are, so your hand is just more sensitive to making that, those sorts of curvatures. Right. And once you have it in your hand, holding it as a complete object, there's something kind of organic and very pleasant about it. How extraordinary. Like kind of river pebble like. Yes. Yeah. You know, yes. Which I, I love as a shape. I think it's amazing. It's also cool that uh, Hagman's been uh, kind of revived as well in a, with Rexup, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was very cool. It I was mean, those Rexup cool. cases are awesome. They're too. stunning. Yeah. Yes. But man, the 3974, that's like a watch that haunts me. That's like <laughs> a watch that like is like end game. For well, me. It's incredible. That that's, incredible. That's a perfect transition because uh, we were, you know, initially we we're going to sit here and talk about independence. But Mark also brought like uh, two jokers with it as well. Um, the first being, well, they're both pad uh, Paddock Perpetual Calendars, uh, and the first is probably the most iconic and legendary Perpetual Calendar ever made. Uh, the, that is, and the first one ever made in series as well. Yes, that's right. Uh, 1526. Yeah. 1526, which was uh, also incredibly enough launched in the middle of the Second World War at a time where things were really bleak. There was so much instability, and yet Paddock came up with this. Mm. Tell us about that, brother. Um, I gotta say, I, you probably know more about it than I do. You've already mentioned it. It's the first serially produced perpetual calendar. Um, I've always liked the look of it, and uh, this particular example is not in great shape, but it was cheap. <laughs> you know? Like, that's really all it comes down to. Like, I wish I could say I had greater scholarship on this matter, right. but it's a really great perpetual calendar. I love the look of it, and it was kind of cheap. And there's something to be said, honestly, for like, really beautiful old watches that aren't in the greatest condition, yeah, you but wear they them. still work great. And you can wear them. And you yeah. can wear them. Exactly. Right? And so I was like, oh, I don't mind. I, I had a customer who was getting out of his vintage watches. He didn't want to wear vintage watches anymore. And um, for some reason, he couldn't find a buyer for this. And so I was like, well, listen, um, if you want, I'll take a stab at it. And I made an offer and he accepted it. And, that's incredible. And that's how it came to be. And you know what, because I've been, like I was from, went from Hong Kong to Switzerland uh, for the H. Moser thing. 
and went from Switzerland um, to New York, and now I find myself here, I wanted to drop that off in Switzerland to get its service because it desperately needs a service. Right. Um, but you know, this is the other thing about when when you buy vintage pieces like this, it's always like a little bit of a it's like adopting. A, it's like adopting a pet. Yes. You know, they, there's like a lot more TLC than you really think about. And it has its own set of idi idiosyncrasies. And, exactly. And it's really getting to understand it and, exactly. and, and working it in the right way. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I don't know, it, it's like my little project right now. Right? <laughs> it's a good so project. So I'll figure out how to like get it back to better condition than it is right now. Understood. And then just wear it around. Cool. You know, and I don't have to sweat it, I don't have to freak out. Um, I think that there's a ton of value <laughs> in like these smaller, Pateks uh, that, it. for the time being, people don't seem paying attention to. Yes, but horologically, mechanically, like they're super significant. They're super beautiful. They're super important. They're super interesting. Dude, when I look at like, because like you know, you look at like the prices of like 5711s, or you look at like the price of 15202s, or whatever, and you're like, dude, I could, you could buy a 1463, like a really nice one, mm -hmm. for for the the price of one of those watches. It's yeah. it's incredible to me. Not that those there's anything wrong with those watches. Watches are great. Yeah. But it's because those watches are so much in the popular consciousness and these are so under the radar at the moment. Yeah. Right. You know? So let's talk about the uh, the second paddock perpetual calendar that you brought with you as well. Ah, oh, this one's a favorite of mine. This is a thirty nine forty. Um, the thirty nine forty <clears throat> you know arguably for me like one of the best perpetual calendars Patek ever made in terms of like the design, the proportion, everything. Micro rotor movement, which just like it's mind boggling that they managed to make such a fine, slim watch that's also automatic, yet also a perpetual calendar. Um, I actually have owned 3940s in the past. So I owned, my first one was in white gold, my right. next one was in platinum, and they were not the earliest series, they were later series. Right. Um, and there's just something about them that was a little too clinical for me. I get like what you're I, saying. I, I thought getting it in a white metal would have made it more wearable. It actually probably made it less wearable. Because it was so serious. Right. right? Austere. It was very austere. Yeah. Um, and the first series in yellow gold just is much more charming to me personally. It, the dial is so expressive. Yes, yeah. exactly. And plus it has the sunken subdials yep. at three and nine. Exactly. And as someone who like loves two and three register chronographs, like I just love that arrangement and the fact that there's like a little bit more dimension to the dial because those subdials are, are sunken, you know. Um, I hope they bring something like this back one day. I think it'd be cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Mark, I have to say it's been an honor, sir. It's been a real pleasure as well. Thank thanks, you for stopping man. by for Zagara pleasure. and sharing these incredible watches with you. No, thanks for having me. Um, really appreciate it. I, I can. Yeah, we, so we have another watch collector off camera, Jack Wong, who's like, as soon as we, I mentioned there's a 1526 here, you just like started smiling. <laughs> I think he's jonesing to get a look at it and hang out with us as well. So we're going to say goodbye for now. Mark, thank you, brother. My pleasure, man. Absolute pleasure. Peace, guys. I know. <laughs>